they outshine it to the point where all you see is that one bright point. So, um, how do you get all that gas to feed the black hole? So, we've gone a long way now. So we're saying here you have this very massive object, very compact, very small. You need material to flow into it to emit all, you get hot and emit all this light. And how are you going to get that gas there? The, one of the biggest misconceptions about black holes is that they're vacuum cleaners. They're not. Good <laughs> well, question. What would happen if our sun magically became a black hole? It could engulf us. Nothing. Nothing. It could be very cold, but absolutely nothing. Because the mass hasn't changed. Our sun is one solar mass. The black hole would be one solar mass. The gravity between us and the sun. The sun is one solar mass worth. Nothing would change, except like I said, it would be very cool, it would be very dark. But that's the thing, is you need to disturb the orbit of something. If something's orbiting something else, it's going to keep orbiting just like Mercury orbits the sun, Venus orbits the sun, Earth orbits the sun, Jupiter. Everything in orbit will remain in orbit unless you somehow disturb that orbit. Now, the big difference again with a black hole is how small it is. So if we took the sun and converted it into a black hole, it would be very small. Now suddenly you can get a lot closer to all of that mass. That's why all of this emission comes about. We can take the Earth and make it a, we have a magic wand and waved it on the Earth and made it into a little black hole. It'll be a very tiny black hole. But if we were the same distance we are now from the center of the Earth, we would feel no different. Of course, now we have a lot longer way to fall. So this isn't the surface anymore. The surface is about 6,000 kilometers below me. And I'm going to fall a lot further down. And when I get closer, and suddenly I'm all up much closer to that entire mass of the Earth. It's not the same as digging to the center of the Earth. If you dig to the center of the Earth, when you reach the center of the Earth, you're going to be weightless. <laughs> because there's no mass underneath you anymore. All the mass of the Earth is all around you. The big deal about a black hole is you take all of that mass and compress it into a very, very, very tiny volume. And that's the thing, is how do you take gas, which is in orbiting and should remain in orbit, just like the Earth orbits the sun, how do you disturb it so that it falls into uh, the black hole? So when I was a graduate student at UCLA, one of my professors, Matt Malkin, and I, we decided, well, the Hubble Space Telescope had just been launched. We'd start looking to see if there was something disturbing the centers of these galaxies to get the gas flowing in there to, to have all of this emission. And hopefully we could determine the true luminosity of AGN that way. And so, in the process, we actually created one of the largest atlas, atlases of AGNs made by Hubble. And, of course, it had a lot of Markarian's galaxies in there. So here are some images, and this is a good way of to see. To see notice that in some sources, clearly the gas is very disturbed, but in some sources, it's not. And in some sources, there's a lot of dust there, so it's a little bit hard to tell. This object is Markarian 6. It's one of the very first ones that uh, Edward Khachikian took spectra of when he was here with Dan Weedman, and it was a good thing because that's what got them interested and noticed that this is a Seifert-like galaxy. And again, this one seems to have some disturbance there, um, but not that one. And oh, there's more dust there. Hard to, hard to tell on that one. Um, not very much disturbed there. That's not disturbed. And that has some dust. Not that sort of disturbed. But, so it was very inconclusive. <laughs> And one of the things that we, uh, here's another one. Well, you know, this is some material coming up, but oh, lots of dust there, can't see there. That one's interesting. That one's stuff, stuff is clearly flowing in there. That's good. Uh, this one, uh, that's pretty, looks regular. Um, this one looks pretty regular. Okay, so again, how are you feeding this? How are you getting that gas to fall in? How are you making this actually emit all of that light? So, uh, Clearly, we needed more data, which is the regular cry of every astronomer. Uh, and then I started working on the Spitzer Space Telescope, which works in the infrared. Now, why is it good in the infrared? Well, guess what? Dust doesn't really show up in the infrared. This is the center of the galaxy, of our galaxy, in optical light, and this is the center of our galaxy in infrared light. You can peer through the dust and actually see the center. So, great idea. I said, let's use Spitzer and start looking at these nearby galaxies to see if we can get a sense of what's going on around, what's fueling all these giant black holes. And this is the difference between an optical image of one of our nearby galaxies, notice the big dust lane there, in the infrared, that's what it looks like. And that's the image from the black hole, from around the black hole. 
So we studied Excuse extra me. spectra, which is... Are these only present in spiral galaxies, or what about elliptic galaxies or irregular galaxies? Uh, not irregulars, interestingly enough. Not irregular. Most irregulars don't have it. Okay. Uh, Seaford galaxies tend to be less luminous. They tend to be in spirals. There's a whole class of what are called radio bright galaxies. Those tend to be in elliptical. So there seems to be some evolutionary phase of which kind of galaxy that you're in. But the nearby ones tend to be mostly spirals, and so that's easier to study just because they're closer, so that's what I picked. Okay. Uh, but they generally, once you get more luminous, they tend to be more in the ellipticals. So certainly, in, 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 we started taking spectra to study the chemistry and see if there was any elemental difference between these guys. And there was another thing that I did, which was, hey, x-rays go through stuff. X-rays go through us. That's why we go to the dentist. X-rays are our teeth because the X-rays go to our, through our teeth. Well, guess what? We have an X-ray observatory up there, the Chandra X-ray Observatory, named after Chandra Sekar because, well, as material flows in to a black hole, it emits a lot of X-rays, so it was appropriate to name it after him. So, uh, one of the things that I did was, hey, let's look for a lot of these objects. That, um, except it's sort of hard to find if, if you start looking further away and you do a big survey of the sky. Where are the black holes? Where are they emitting all these active galaxies? Well, if you look here, it's very difficult to find any. It's just lots of sources. And that's not, we didn't take a picture of the moon. We just put the moon up there as a scale. This is how much of a, this is a very large scale survey of the sky. But we also did that with the Chandra Observatory. Its the resolution isn't the same, but every single dot that you see here is a supermassive black hole at the center of a galaxy swallowing up all that gas and emitting x-rays. So there's a lot of these guys out there. Do, quick question. Sure. Do you know how far away uh, in that survey uh, some of them were? Like what the range Oh yeah, range yeah. Is? So we use, uh, because the universe is expanding, uh, there's a relation between how far away something is and how, for, how quickly it's going away from us. So we get, have at least a good sense of about how far away these guys are. So we were picking up fairly distant sources. Um, about, you know, the, the furthest ones were about like three quarters of the way to the beginning of the universe. But um, most of them were not that far away. Most of them were much, much closer, and that's what we were trying to get. But the idea is to get a census of all of these supermassive black holes, because one of the ideas is, geez, <coughs> how, if, if you plant a seed and a plant grows, geez, if every galaxy has a black hole at the center, which came first? Did the black hole come, become the seed for the galaxy to form around it? Or is it just that the galaxy formed and then the heavier stuff sort of sank to the center and became a black hole? Well, the seed idea has, has caught a lot of people's attention. So people started wondering, is it our galaxy? Does our galaxy have a black hole at its center? Well, we're not an active galaxy. There's not much coming out of the center of our galaxy, even with the blockage of the, uh, the dust lane. If you look at it in the infrared, you can certainly see through it, but there's not any real excess emission. If you just add up all the stars at the center of our galaxy, that's how much light we're getting. Well, people, uh, but there's some radio emission coming there from there. Well, that was interesting. But how do you even look at the center of the galaxy? It's really, really crowded. There's a lot of stars there. What's going on there? How can you even separate out one source from another? It becomes what's called confusion permitted. Lasers are the answer. This is the, very, uh, the VLT, which is a telescope in the southern hemisphere operated by the Europeans. That's our wonderful galaxy. And what you can do is you can project a spot on the upper atmosphere, because one of the problems is how bad our atmosphere is when it distorts anything we're trying to look at. And it basically, you project a spot, and then you make your camera have optics that deform, and they undo the distortion of the atmosphere, and you, you, you're trying, you know it's a spot, so you make it back into a spot. And it's called adaptive optics. What does that mean? This is the result of adaptive optics. That's how you can actually pick out individual sources in an incredibly crowded field when the atmosphere is not doing its, is not helping you out on trying to do your job. So here it is, one more time. This is what it looks like 
with the distortion from the atmosphere. This is what it looks like when you project the 